In 1995, director Paul Anderson brought an arcade classic to life in one of the first blockbuster video game adaptations, starring Robin Shu as Liu Kang, Wyndon Ashby as Johnny Cage, Bridget Wilson as Sonya Blade, Trevor Godard as Kano, and Talisa Soto as Katana. When Earthrealm is threatened by Shang Tsung, Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa, and the forces of Outworld, Lord Raiden, Christopher Lambert assembles the world's greatest champions to compete in an ancient martial arts tournament to decide the fate of the realms known as Mortal Kombat. In each of us, there burns the fury of a warrior. In every generation, a few are chosen to prove it. One of you three will decide the outcome of the tournament. Three strangers. <laughs> will travel to the mystical realm of Outworld to defend our people against Shang Tsung. You will die. And his forces of darkness. In an ancient tournament, one more victory. Your soul is mine. And our world no! is theirs. It has begun. You can't run from me, Shang! I don't need to run! Nothing in this world can prepare you for this. You have been chosen by the Elder Gods as a representative of Earthrealm to record in the podcast of the century. Every season, the best podcasters from around the world are assembled to review, reminisce, and riff on a popular franchise on the latest season of Podcasters Assemble. With the imminent release of the latest highly anticipated Mortal Kombat film, we're taking a look back at all the movies and games of the Mortal Kombat franchise. Choose your mic. Together, you will be facing off against the gauntlet of films. 1995's Mortal Kombat, 1997's Mortal Kombat Annihilation, 2020's Mortal Kombat Scorpion's Revenge, and finally, this year's release of Mortal Kombat in theaters and on HBO Max on Friday, April 23rd, 2021. <clears throat> Go to probablywork.com for more information on how to submit to this or future seasons of the show and listen to the latest episodes of Podcasters Assemble. Mortal Podcast! Podcasters Assemble? Hey there, I'm Kai Lee from Verzian Chronicles. Yo, this is Corey from The World Is My Burrito. Eric Slater here from Epic Fails of History and Too Young for This Trek. Hi, this is Zach from both the Neatcast and the Effin' Cultured podcasts. Hi, I'm Stephen White, co-host of the Super Mega Crash Brothers Turbo podcast. Hello, I am Lacey Finley, co-host of the Super Mega Crash Brothers Turbo podcast. Hello, this is MC from the best animated shows ever. So far. Hey, this is Chris from the Comic Zombie Podcast and from Epic Fails of History. Hi, this is Just Naki, graphic designer and one half scene in Nautico. This is Troidal Power from the Power Playthroughs Podcast. Hello, my name is Ben Thompson. I am from Badass of the Week. And this is my synopsis slash review of Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat. Ah, Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat. 1995's Mortal Kombat. And today, we're talking Mortal Kombat. So uh, here's my entry for Mortal Kombat movie 1995. 
1995. A movie I have actually not seen in nearly five years. I'm excited to give it a go. This was such a trip down memory lane for me. This movie holds up. Uh, the first time I saw this was probably back in 95. So I've never seen this movie before. I first saw this movie as a kid and was blown away by it. For a teenager in the 90s, this movie was a big deal. It's a crappy movie, but it still rocks. Um, I do remember when it was coming out, and I remember, I think my older brother went to see it. I would have been about nine. It's probably been as many years as this movie is old since I've seen it. But this, this, was, this was a banned movie for young Troy because, oh... It's that violent video game, the one with the blood and the gore. Never mind that it was PG-13. There was a movie of Mortal Kombat. However, it was one of my favorite movies of all times. I don't know really how to feel about this. I'm a little bit torn. Uh, I was a huge fan of the games growing up. You know, they came out when I was a kid. That I own two copies of it and have watched it at least 80 times. I don't know how many times I watched it as a kid. I mean, between this, Power Rangers and Karate, I was totally down for a good martial arts fight. Just to give you a little background on this, uh, when this movie came out, I was 15 years old and I was going to school full time and working 30 hours a week at a martial arts school while I trained for my black belt. I was also huge into Taekwondo at the time, so this movie really hit the spot. It was like this and Karate Kid Part 2. Those were my jam. Just hit all the right buttons. This is like a fan of horror and video games. It was and, and martial arts. <laughs> it was perfect. I did everything at the martial arts school from like windexing the windows to teaching classes to vacuuming the floors to shutting the place down. I would go straight from my school, get picked up, eat in the car, go straight Right there, work from from three to eight, take my class from eight to eight to nine, and then go home. So I lived martial arts between the years of like 1994 and 1997. Add some magic, boom! Magic was real back then. I had encountered Mortal Kombat in the arcade. Uh, I was a big fan of Street Fighter II. I loved that game. And then Mortal Kombat came out, and a lot of my friends had Super Nintendos or Sega Genesis. The games are already a huge deal for me and many others just like me. I was a huge fan of the game in the arcade, especially the second one, even though I wasn't very good at it. You know, the, the second game in particular really kind of stoked my passion for the franchise. I would usually just duck and spam undercut everyone like a bitch until I got to Kentaro and got my ass handed to me on a silver platter. And when the movie got announced, it was, you know, it was super exciting. So seeing that a film was being made damn near broke my brain. And then when they announced that the Mortal Kombat film was coming out, oh, I was, I was pumped. I was into fighting games. Uh, one of my favorites was Mortal Kombat back then. And I played a lot of video games, so Mortal Kombat, the movie, was created specifically for me. I loved Sub-Zero. My two favorite characters, especially from the first game or two, are Johnny Cage and Sub-Zero. I uh, also love Lelina, but that's just more of a... I like fighting with her. So I'm pretty sure it would have piqued my interest. So yeah, I, I never got a chance to see it as a kid, so I was, I was pretty excited to sit down and watch it. Remember, kids, video game movies were much rarer then than they are today. I remember we went to see it, my friends and I, at like the midnight premiere, which was very rare back then, and it was sold out. <laughs> so we had to go see it at like 10.30 in the morning on a Saturday, or uh, excuse me, on a Friday. I believe it came out during the summer. If not, I'm misremembering the whole thing and just forget it. I grew up in a small town, Bethlehem, New Hampshire. The closest movie theater was in the next town over in Littleton. Me and my friends, we went to Jack's Junior Cinemas, where you could go see a movie, get a popcorn and a soda for 10 whole dollars. I know, movies used to be affordable. We were so excited to see one of our favorite fighting games on the big screen. I think by this point in time, there may have been two or three. I know Super Mario Brothers was already out. I'm almost positive I saw the trailer for this film when I saw Street Fighter, but I could be wrong. I also think there was a Double Dragon movie out around the same time, but I'm not 100% sure. Those are all I can remember, and I struggle to say positive things about those, so I'll move along. But at the time, I remember thinking it was pretty good. I liked it. I didn't love it. I love this movie. Uh, there's heaps of little Easter eggs, including like some scenes set in like some of the 
stages. Uh, it was great actually going into it with that memory that I held on to for all this time. Because uh, let's just say with my memory being what it is today, we could basically say this was my first time seeing the film with large amounts of deja vu. It is probably the best schlock martial arts film on the planet. 15-year-old me was the exact target audience for this movie. It was very entertaining back in the day. And I friggin' loved it. To this day, I honestly think this is still one of the best video game movies ever made. Hell, this movie was one of the better video game movies ever to come out. To me, Mortal Kombat is one of the best video game movie adaptations ever made. Sure, it's very 90s, probably the most 90s, but that's part of the charm. It's just a dumb, fun movie. I could even argue that it still is. Watching it now, um, it doesn't really tickle any nostalgia so much. I remember collecting the comics, the trading cards, action figures, and pogs. Uh, there was even an animated series. For a moment in the 90s, MK was huge. It's just really kind of... <sighs> right around the time of this movie, there was this um, straight-to-video animated prequel, and it's absolutely terrible. Apparently, it was a failed pilot to the animated series or something. I've also heard that the novelization of this is actually pretty good, but I've never been able to get my hands on it. Uh, so I admit, as far as playing the games goes, I've probably played three or four in the series, and most of those experiences were in the arcades than in my own home. Obviously, films like Sonic the Hedgehog and Detective Pikachu are good films in their own right, featuring video game characters. But could you say that they are faithful adaptations of the material? I don't think so. It falls into a lot of the traps of video game movies and a lot of adaptation films uh, in general did at the time. And for the time, considering they were only basing this off of like two arcade games and a comic book, I think it's a pretty great adaptation. Let's just say there probably wasn't even that much lore back then that we do have now. Director Paul W.S. Anderson was fairly new at this point, having only directed one other movie prior to this. Didn't know who he was, Although I could say I didn't really know many directors at the time. I was aware of a few. This movie is directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, not to be confused with Wes Anderson. A Wes Anderson Mortal Kombat movie would be a very different beast. Anyway, I had no preconceived notions about what he would or wouldn't do wrong here. Now, after his string of Resident Evil films, I'm a much harsher critic of his. Uh, Paul W.S. Anderson, he's he's a mixed bag. He did the new Monster Hunter. He did the Death Race movies. Um, he did the Resident Evil ones. There's a couple good things in the Resident Evil series, I have to admit. That said, I did dig Monster Hunter, so the guy is kind of hit and miss for me. I mean, video game movies in general are always a, a dodgy business to begin with, but this one should have been just slam dunk. But, uh, you know, PG-13 right off the bat, and you know, okay, something's wrong here. But this is great. He did Event Horizon, which I think is great. So he's a he's an interesting character, but uh, just a fun fact that this was like his first major film uh, directing role. You know, and for a product of his time, there's some things that are, have aged pretty well uh, and some things that have not so much. <laughs> some of the um, random slow-mos and hairstyles and stuff didn't really carry over that well. Honestly, the worst parts of this movie are the CGI and the cheese. I mean, it's not all bad, but there's there's some stuff to nitpick for sure. And even then, it's not terrible, just dated. At this point in time, there really wasn't much to the story of Mortal Kombat like there is today. It's also, you know, the story's pretty cliche. The movie dives into the lore, I mean, kind of, of the video games for whatever lore there really was in the 90s. I mean, the overarching story of Mortal Kombat on the whole, the original at least, is kind of cliche as far as martial arts movies go. I love that they didn't shy away from the bonkers story. Um, video games, like fighting games, are not known for having like intricate stories. You have to like come up with some basic framework for all these guys to fight each other. And in Mortal Kombat, it's like, oh, it's a tournament uh, in Outworld for like the fate of the planet. So basically, you know the drill. So with the with the plot line we're given, they are badass people and have been chosen to fight for us. Liu Kang goes to Shang Tsung's island and the tournament happens. And they are the mere mortals that are the key to saving us. Um, which is really goofy and weird, but I like that they just kind of leaned into it for the movie and didn't try to like come up with some more rational or like less insane reason why all these people were fighting each other. So sticking to the basics of fighters competing in a tournament to protect their world 
wasn't difficult. But they really had a chance to, to make this something special. And, it, and it's just... It misses the mark in a lot of places. I just, I love how bad the story is in 90s action movies. And they chose not to complicate it either, which is great for this film because it's all you really needed. At its heart, this movie is a classic good versus evil story. And as dumb as it is, it still resonates with me. Just lay the groundwork. That's enough plot for me. Let's kick butt. movie opens up with probably the coolest opening to any movie I've ever seen. The movie opens with one of the coolest title sequences to one of the best techno beats of the 90s. First, the movie opens up with the Mortal Kombat scream, then theme. And the film wouldn't be the same without the signature theme, Techno Syndrome. And of course, I have to give special props to that soundtrack. As far as the good, it starts right off the bat. The soundtrack. The soundtrack is fantastic. Because you just get that Mortal Kombat. You can't help but yell, Mortal Kombat! when it starts. I mean, that's just epic. Uh, I hope you like the Mortal Kombat song because you're about to hear it about 550 times. You press play on Amazon Prime and the first thing you hear, Mortal Kombat! Before you even see the new line cinema logo. Remember when that was the thing? And we kick it all off with that amazing tech note. Go straight into the song. Yo, this song did and does still slap. And then the music kicks in that. Fort! If you listen to that soundtrack and don't get pumped or do a little dance or at the very least wiggle around in your seat, I don't even know what to do for you. It's bizarre that this particular tune has persisted after all this time. As the credits play over flames reflected off a shiny black Mortal Kombat logo. Very reminiscent of the Tim Burton Batman opening it in the best way. And it's great and there's flames on the screen and stuff and for 45 seconds it's metal as hell and it rocks. This changed the game for intro music. I love this stuff. And, and then it doesn't anymore. The Mortal Kombat song, fun fact, uh, was the first EDM album to ever go platinum in the United States. Uh, I love that. Eat shit, Hans Zimmer. You're old hat now. I actually had both the game and the movie soundtracks on CD back in the day. I even had the original score soundtrack for this movie, the original motion picture soundtrack, and the terrible CD of songs based on the characters in the Mortal Kombat game. Like, that whole Mortal Kombat album felt like nothing more than a quick cash grab, but somehow that tune rose above it all. The soundtrack throughout the entire film, I again, holds up today. But it is catchy, though. Fun thing about this song, I had a martial arts demonstration along with my brother to this song. We had like bow staffs and we would fight. He was a few years younger than me and we would we were on the demonstration team for our martial arts school. Uh, and we had a demo where we fought each other with sticks to this song. And the way we got it was not by purchasing the album, but by taping the theme song off of the TV using record on a cassette player boombox. This song always gets me jazzed up. I would play that soundtrack just to get me pumped before any big thing I would want to go do. It's amazing. I'm already just like super jacked. But as a whole, uh, the, the music in the film is actually really strong. I mean, it's very 90s, but it's it's really strong. It's It supports the tone they're going for, for the most part. I read an interview. They were getting prepped for the new movie, and I read an interview with the guy that screams Mortal Kombat at the beginning. And it's a print article, so it's, you know, you can't successfully like translate what's going on. On, but the question was, it was like, Q, like, would you do it? Would you do the, would you yell it? And the guy's like, over the phone? And they're like, yeah. And then he, and then he just says, Mortal Kombat. And it's with all in bold with like a bunch of A's. And I just loved the way that that was written. How do you not hear that Mortal Kombat? I not want to give it a little, you know, a little jig, a little jig, do a little dance. Now I just want to go fight a lightning god. I think they did a nice job with it. Then it kind of sucks after that. Sure, they changed a few things here and there. They took some liberties, cheesed it up, and made it PG-13. But that techno theme is still stuck in my head. And right off the bat, the first thing that I can address is the rating of the film. It's PG-13, and for the life of me, I cannot understand how that makes sense. And for a PG-13 movie, it's actually kind of brutal from the get-go. So that, okay, the, the first the first real scene of the movie is these people fighting with like a weird fake storm in the background and stuff, but then it turns out that it's a dream sequence. So I guess that's fine, that it looked awful. First, we meet Liu Kang's younger brother, Chan, who is 
fighting Shang Tsung. Man, this movie's starting off hard with some James Dean, Mr. Miyagi dude beating up a small child. All right, straight out of the song, we cut to Shang Tsung beating the shit out of a kid. He fails miserably, Shang kills him and turns into a mummy. Liu Kang's brother gets his spine broken 30 seconds into the movie after a lame slow-mo battle. But at the same time, like, it is the first scene in the movie. You'd think you'd try and make it look good. I mean, I know PG-13 films generally are going to make more money because you have a broader audience. But you, really? Mortal Kombat? That's the one you want to go with that on? And he delivers, immediately sets the tone with, like, maybe the best line in the movie when he's like, your brother's soul is mine. Our first scene is Liu Kang having a nightmare about Shang Tsung murdering his brother. You will be next. Liu wakes up and rereads a Western Union telegraph. Liu Kang then wakes up to a Western Union telegram informing him that his brother has died and he needs to come home. By the way, this movie came out in 1995, and yet it took another 11 years for Western Union to finally stop sending telegraphs. That fact seems wrong somehow. And then we go through all of our typical main character introductions. All the character introductions are good. We get the intros for the various characters that are going to be the heroes of this story. The cast, for the most part, is pretty spot on. And one thing that can ruin a good plot is bad actors. The bad, you know, right off the bat, the casting is not great. And while I can't say that the entire cast crushes it, none of them are really terrible. I used to think that some of them were pretty cool, but <laughs> looking at it now, the whitewashing is pretty bad, you know. Basically, we get a lot of character introductions here. We're gradually introduced to the rest of the main cast. But going back, uh, let's see. Um, I don't remember anybody's name. So you got Liu Kang. But we meet a guy who, like, left his ancient martial arts order to go explore America and he has to come back. And Liu Kang is, is quiet and pensive in his sullen apartment. Liu Kang, I think, is my favorite. The guy who plays Liu Kang, Robin Shou, is really awesome. I think he's great in this. Robin Shou, who was fairly unknown at the time before this flick, does just fine as Liu Kang. He's freaking awesome. Uh, Liu Kang kind of sucks. Robin Shou is great as Liu Kang. He's got an amazing mullet. He's got this good history of being like a Hong Kong action hero, but he's a good actor and he looks like he can really do a lot of this stuff, which is very cool. I'm a big fan of him. His fight scenes still hold up to this day. I will fight people about it. He also appears in the DOA movie and that terrible Chun-Li movie and then in a bunch of the Death Race movies. So I guess, I don't know, he had some kind of a video game thing going on. Talent is talent. No disrespect to Robin Shao. I think actually his fight scenes are my favorite in the entire film still even now after rewatching it he has the look and the martial arts skills to boot and he definitely channels bruce lee at times sonya blade bridget wilson is fine it's about all i can muster for her next up being sonya blade in some club um there's some american mercenary who's like running through a bumpin nightclub with a shotgun out walking through with a fully loaded shotgun that seems safe and nobody gives her even a second look you'd think they would sonya blades at a punk rock show doing that like awesome low angle uh, thing that they did in the 90s where like you shoot a shotgun from the hip and fireworks and stuff come out the barrel we meet sonya blade she's an american uh, special forces officer pursuing kano because he killed her partner i especially like seeing sonya and Jax pursuing kano in hong kong oh if you don't recognize sonya you might remember so hot Want to touch the hiney? Because Bridget Wilson also played Veronica Vaughn in Billy Madison, same year this came out. Bridget Wilson is a good Sonya Blade, but I hate that they make her a damsel in distress by the end of the movie. The girl who plays Sonya for Billy Madison, not my, my favorite in the role. This role was originally supposed to be played by Cameron Diaz, but while she was training uh, in martial arts, she broke her wrist and uh, was unable to complete the stunts and fight sequences, so they had to replace her with Bridget Wilson, who had previously been in Billy Madison and Last Action Hero. Originally, uh, Cameron Diaz was apparently set to play her, but had a wrist injury. She's chasing Kano, played by Trevor Goddard. Um, you've got Kano, who rightfully gets his ass kicked. There's a robot man. He's half his face is a robot. Kano's spawn eye looks fake as hell. Like, the metal looks good, how it's affixed to his face, but the red eye is just stupid. That's pretty cool. Fun, fun fight. Though he's English, he plays an Aussie. And from this point forward, Kano is retconned to be Australian. Trevor Goddard as Kano is a little over the top, but he's not completely terrible. He's basically who I think of when I play the games. Trevor Goddard is clearly having fun as Kano. You just love to hate him. Which is bittersweet when you're reminded that he died of a drug overdose in 
2004. Uh, don't 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 mean to bring the room down here, but just just pointing out factual information. You've got Johnny Cage, uh, and then we meet an actor who I mean you don't know he's an actor at first. You just think he's a guy in a suit who is just a treat, just a beautiful treat. And he whoops the butt of a bunch of of goons with each. They each have their own unique weapon. Next up, Johnny Cage. Who we think is about to take on a very lame mob in a warehouse. You know, Lyndon Ashby is Johnny Cage. Well done. And then it turns out that it's it's their film in a movie. And I, I, that scene was pretty fun because I was like, this is cheesy as hell. But it turns out to be a terrible movie shoot. But again, kind of like the, the crappy look of the fight at the very beginning. It's cheesy as hell because it's a movie. It's supposed to be cheesy as hell. I kind of like that. We meet Johnny Cage, the Hollywood martial arts superstar who's dealing with, in his opinion, novices. And he doesn't want to deal with this movie anymore. And uh, Johnny Cage probably isn't exactly what I would picture now. Lyndon Ashby. We may not look the part of Johnny Cage, at least not in my mind, but he's great. 25 years ago, probably. I Now you would expect a bigger dude, more muscular, I guess, maybe taller. Um, but the charisma, the charisma I still feel was nailed. And Johnny Cage is beating some dudes up on a movie set with nunchucks. This is where you fall down. I love it. It, it. it embodied that persona that they've given us with Johnny Cage all of these years and still now. I think the charisma, yeah, it works. That's Johnny. And then we get Johnny Cage fighting a bunch of extras in a suit while being directed by a fake Spielberg. And the director, I believe, was originally supposed to be Steven Spielberg, but they couldn't get him in to actually play the part. Apparently, John claude Van Damme and Tom Cruise were both in the running at one point, but Lyndon Ashby is probably the best possible version of 90s Johnny Cage. It turns out that the actor actually is a fantastic martial artist. He's who I think of when I think of Johnny Cage. Johnny walks off set, eventually is uh, convinced and talked into joining the Mortal Kombat tournament, which would be real, unlike these uh, fake movies, since he's getting bad press at the moment. And the guy who's orchestrating this whole thing invites him to the tournament. Johnny's agent tells him about the upcoming tournament. But it turns out to be uh, disguised Shang Tsung. Shang Tsung, disguised as Cage's agent, convinces Johnny to enter the tournament. Now, as someone who could turn into other people's whose souls he stole, does that mean Shang Tsung killed Johnny's agent just to get him to the tournament? Because he's getting all these people to the tournament. You've got Sub Zero, you've got Scorpion, of course you got Shang Tsung, and you got Raiden. Raiden's there, I think, is the electricity god, so that's cool. Meanwhile, Liu Kang returns home to his grandfather, and the Shaolin monks in Thailand, I, <clears throat> I mean China, where he meets Highlander, I mean Lord Raiden, and vows revenge for his brother. Lou goes home to Cambodia, where apparently the entire town's just waiting for him to walk off the boat, just standing, staring straight ahead. You gotta love 90s movies where a bunch of ancient Asian dudes worship a white man as their god. Liu Kang goes home to the Shaolin Monk Temple, or the Temple of Light, or that's Warcraft, I don't know. Mad props to Liu Kang for not giving a damn whether or not the dude he was dissing was a god. And he meets Lord Raiden. Raiden being played by Christopher Lambert. Who he does not believe is a actual thunder god. He thinks it's just an old man. Do you think they bought Raiden's outfit from their local Zensation? My favorite actor would have to be... It would have to be either Christopher Lambert or the guy who plays Shang Tsung. Shang Tsung is well cast as well. The two standouts here are Christopher Lambert and Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa. Nailed it. With the latter actually being the most memorable. We also have Lord Raiden, played by the Highlander himself, Christopher Lambert. Played by Christopher Lambert. And then, of course, we have Christopher Lambert, Highlander himself as Lord Raiden. He's really good in this, I think, and has some of my favorite moments. You know, short of that, uh, Raiden is, Christopher Lambert's Raiden makes no sense to me. It's just really bad. He's maybe not who I'd cast in the role, but he does bring some gravitas to it. L Lambert, is the T silent? Also, I totally forgot Highlander was Raiden. Now, if there's some kids listening, you probably have no idea what I just said, and it has nothing to do with anything. So moving forward. Christopher Lambert does fine, but his French accent fumbles over a line or two, and it's a... Uh... Kind of humorous. He did a fine job. I was really only familiar with him in those movies, though, and with those movies being over 30 years old. Uh... In an amazing performance. Amazingly goofy performance. Yeah. Big fan. So cheesy. Okay, can someone get Raiden Arigula? His throat is so damn dry. I really like Christopher Lambert as Raiden. I think he adds this weird, like, kookiness to the character and this humor to it that really works for me. I think he's awesome. 
My favorite and least favorite actor in this movie is Christopher Lambert, hamming it up. The accent actually was kind of hard for me to tell if it was him or a character choice, but it gave me plenty of smiles, only on certain words, so it really wasn't no big deal for me. We deserved more, but I'm not sure who could have done that role justice. Uh, Sean Connery, maybe? In like a whole Zardos outfit? While it makes sense for him to not compete in the tournament, you know, as a god, it's also a little disappointing that we don't really get to see Raiden in action. We just get like a sneak peek of his powers. But as the first movie in the series, it kind of makes sense. You know, a little bit less is more. Overall, I think my favorite parts from the movie are anything involving Christopher Lambert or Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa. Uh, both of them just seem to act really good and just like chew up the scenery at times. Tagawa chews scenery and elevates his movie to a whole other level. Tagawa really steals the show with his over-the-top performances as Shang Tsung. Shang Tsung is just amazing in this. I love him. I love every time he's on screen. It's amazing. I think he's a, uh, he just really owns this and it's awesome. Much like Frank Langella did as Skeletor in Masters of the Universe but that's a whole other topic. Um, yeah. Chris just, his version of Raiden makes me crack up all the time, and Carrie as Shang Tsung, he's so over the top, but he's so iconic. There's a reason why this version of the character was brought in as a uh, an add-on for Mortal Kombat 11 Shang Tsung. He so embodies this character, in fact, that they actually brought him back for the Mortal Kombat Legacy live-action series, and even had him voice the character in Mortal Kombat 11. I was truly excited to see Tagawa return to the role in Mortal Kombat 11 and really be able to do so much more with the character. I would have said the same about the other actors, but meh. Here's another fun piece of trivia. Shang Tsung and Johnny Cage are voiced by these actors in Mortal Kombat 11. Um, and I also discovered when I was just kind of poking around to see what everybody had been doing these days. Did you know that Brigitte Wilson, who played Sonya, and the actor who played Johnny also voiced those two characters in the MK11 game? Although they got Ronda Rousey to be Sonya Blade instead of Veronica Vaughn. You probably did. I'm just going to pretend like I taught you something. The next movie gives us Ajax from the Warriors, aka Dexter's dad, and I still think Lambert was better. Just missed opportunities more than anything. It's not like anybody's egregiously terrible. It's just they could have done so much better. We then jump forward to China, where the official tournament boat will be arriving to take everyone, all of our Earth warriors, off for this mortal combat. Everyone ends up at a dock in Hong Kong when some old-ass Chinese junk pulls up to the dock. A mysterious ancient dragon ship approaches. The ancient Chinese boat with the tattered sails is a nice touch. Why is everyone on this boat dock doing metal work outside of the warehouses that are right next to them? We also get a humorous, slightly racist scene where Johnny Cage pays Lou to take his bags on board, not realizing he's not a coolie. I love this moment where Cage pays Liu Kang to carry his bags, and he just dumps his suitcase in the bay. And Lou throws the luggage in the water, takes the cash, and walks away. Sonya shows up trying to find Kano, but I'm gonna tell you, it's really hard to be stealthy when your eyes f- glow. Sonya hops on board just as the boat is leaving. This cool, creepy boat shows up to take everybody away. I think the design of the boat is super cool, and I love that Sonya Blade's like, all right, Jax, bye, you're not in this movie anymore. You, you got maybe a line of dialogue, and now you're out of the movie. Everybody gets on board without questioning anything about the boat, why it's completely surrounded by fog and mist. That that does not seem like good sailing conditions. Not safe at all. And now we're on an adventure. Sonya is taking off looking for Kano. Johnny Cage has the hots for her, so he, of course, follows along with Liu Kang, who is looking for Shang Tsung. I love this whole exposition scene on the boat where all the characters meet below decks. The three musketeers go down into the hold, but are greeted by Sub-Zero and Scorpion. They then run into Shang, Scorpion, and Sub-Zero. Scorpion and Sub-Zero, deadliest of enemies, but slaves under my power. As disappointing as it was not to see Scorpion and Sub-Zero go at it, at least they made a passing reference to their history and why they aren't fighting each other in this film. I do think that Scorpion and Sub-Zero were somewhat mishandled in this one, but I guess, I mean, considering at the time neither one had a really intricate backstory like they do now, uh, it makes sense. It's just a little odd the way they're introduced as henchmen. And then Scorpion and Sub-Zero, essentially non-factors in the film other than a fight scene or two, but uh, clearly they're just, you know, just white dudes, stunt guys. Both doing their thing with top-of-the-line effects from 1995. 
terrible. Sub Zero and Johnny Cage are always my favorite characters, but man, Sub Zero, he and Scorpion are, you know, the faces of the franchise for better for like they, they are what people think of when they think Mortal Kombat, I would say then probably Goro. And they, they get shortchanged pretty hard in this film. You know, I don't know if the film should have been about them, but they could have been much more prominently featured. So in the boat, the, the Sub Zero and Scorpion animation is bad, but you know, acceptable. But before anything can even happen, Raiden shows up. Raiden shows up just in time to stop Shang Tsung from cheating in the tournament. And then Raiden ruins the whole damn sequence with the worst electric ball animation. Takes out Scorpion and Sub-Zero and says how attacking the Earth Warriors before the tournament is forbidden. We also get one of the best lines of the movie. A handful of people on a leaky boat are going to save the world. Raiden says, listen, what you're about to face is vastly more important than your ego your enemy, or your quest for vengeance. You have embarked on a sacred mission. You have been chosen to defend the realm of Earth in a tournament called Mortal Kombat. I love Raiden's line where he's like, the fate of billions will depend on one of you. Ha ha ha. Sorry. Or really any time that Raiden just laughs, he does his little <laughs> I think we needed a little more of that in this movie, but like when it happens and when it comes and when Raiden's being a goofball, it's great. It just seems so out of place, but it I find it entertaining. And then we get Shang Sun proclaiming, It has begun! This, I mean, okay. <sighs> This was this was pretty epic back then. This was pretty epic when it came out. Still gives me chills. That boat ends up at Skull Island. We finally arrive at the island, and also the tiny little boats are terrifying. This this whole island looks awesome. So now that we've entered Combat Island, um, is it just me or does Johnny have two more bags every single time we see him? We see that Johnny Cage has found all of Princess Vespa's matched luggage from the Spaceballs movie. I swear, like, he only went to the boat with, like, one or two bags. And then on the boat, he had a couple more. And then off the boat, he has a couple more. Another great line from Sonia. Do I look like your travel agent? Apparently, this movie was primarily filmed on location in Thailand. They even had to float the cast and crew to the sets on little canoes. We are introduced to Princess Katana, even though we don't know it's her quite yet. 